I, I turned pro at age 15 because at that time, like I said, it was a new sport. I, uh, I started off racing in the beginner's class and right away moved from, you know, beginners to uh, intermediate or novice and intermediate and then to expert. But then at 15, they I had a pro class. And then at the local races, they were starting to get, you know, like pro money, just collecting money from passing a hat around and getting from the from the fans and the families and stuff like that. And yeah, before we knew we had a probably about a hundred to two hundred dollar winners, you know, a purse for a winner. So and then they broke it down to like top three and stuff. So, yeah, it was fun to race local racing and making money and making, you know, maybe a hundred to two hundred dollars at a small race. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I was the youngest at that time, 15 to turn pro, because when I um, at 15, that's when they had the first pro class in BMX. And so from 19, I think it was 1975, uh, I started racing. Uh, I was the youngest. And then at 1976, um, I got a factory sponsor from Mongoose. Um, and, you know, so Mongoose uh, was my first, uh, you know, real contract. And that was in 1976. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Stable Cyclist Podcast. My name is JP, and we've got an exciting episode for you this week. One of the all-time goats of mountain biking in the United States of America, Tinker Juarez, is here today to chat with us about his career and his accomplishments and why he's still going. And before we get Tinker in here, I just want to start by thanking everyone who is listening and watching this is our 10th episode only of the Stable Cyclist Podcast, and I have been blown away by how fast this has grown. And we have regular listeners all over the world, including places like Germany, United Kingdom, and Colombia. The podcast is growing because you are all doing an amazing job at sharing the podcast, and let's keep that going. While you're listening today, make sure to take a screenshot and do me a favor and Tag the Stable Cyclist, as well as today's guest, Tinker Juarez. You can find him on social at Tinker.Juarez. And share that on your story so we can see who's listening and we can keep spreading the love around. This episode is brought to you by Flow Formulas. If you are training for a big race or if you're just training to be healthy, you want to be performing at your best each and every day. And you need Flow Formulas Endurance Mix and Recovery Mix as well. I am a super salty sweater, so for me, when I head to the Flow Formulas online store, I make sure to throw a bag of the high-sodium mix into my cart. And if you've got a cart full of goodies ready to go with Flow Formula, you should use the code JOHNPETER15 at checkout for a discount on that cart full of goodies. All right, enough of all of that what you're here for today let's get in the studio and talk with tinker juarez well tinker juarez welcome to the stable cyclist podcast it is an honor to be uh talking to you and having lined up next to you at the mata 100 in the past we'll get into that in later in the interview but it's it's really good to see you man and uh yeah, I see you're, you You had a real good result over the weekend and uh, you getting your race season kicked off. So how, how are things getting started for you this year? Um, I think the season's going. It's starting off really good. Um, yeah, I just raced this past weekend, and it was, uh, it was a short race, an uh, hour and a half. So um, I was really happy how I raced, uh, and my, times, my time was really good. So... I knew I had those. I knew I still had the speed. I just needed to, uh, you know, hope you know have that good day, and it was. It turned out being a good day. Man, an hour and a half race for, an hour and a half race for you these days must feel like a short track race compared to what you're you're typically doing in the ultra endurance world. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't race cross country as much anymore, and I and I do just for the just to prepare myself for the world championships masters. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, you, I like racing a local race here in Temecula because it's, uh, got some good competition and the riders are fast. So, and it, it just helps me get ready for the, uh, for the master world. Um, so yeah, it, it was, you know, I normally do marathons, but I also, I just wanted to get more races in. So the, you know, there happened to be a local race and uh, cross country, and it happened to be a pretty big one. Um, so, yeah, so it was good to uh, 
to get yeah good to check out my speed and it went really well so i was checking out my time and i was comparing to the other guys' time and i was you know my time was really good i mean there was a few guys that were beating me in the beginning of the season and i compared my time with one of the guys and uh and i actually was faster than him so it was it was cool to see that so yeah it was yeah i just need anything to keep boosting myself up so you are originally from the Los Angeles area. You're still in the Los Angeles area. And your background, everybody thinks about you today as this ultra endurance legend. And I want to ta- kind of talk them through your career. And, and that means we're starting out with BMX. And how did you get into racing BMX at 13 years old? Right, right. Well, um, you know, it was just, uh, there was a park down my, uh, down the road from my house and I used to meet my friends after school and there was a big, big dirt mound up there. And we, we kind of made it into a track and we would, uh, bring our shovels and stuff like every, you know, every day and, and, and just kind of create a BMX track. And, uh, and at that time there was not ever, there wasn't even a sport of BMX racing, but then, um, uh, so the local guy at the park, uh, he started a, uh, you know, he started, he wanted to have a race there and that's kind of, you know, I kind of started racing BMX there and it was called, uh, yeah, it was called Hollyfield park where I started. So, uh, so we, yeah, we just got a bunch of friends and we used to meet up there and then eventually they made a race, you know, they had a race there and, and I started racing there and, and then there was, you know, then the sport just started, you know, st- started growing by having races in the, all around, you know, uh, all around town, uh, different towns. So, yeah, I was able to travel, you know, just go on weekends and race locally. So I was doing that for, you know, that's kind of how my career started, um, just by racing a lot of local races. Yeah. And you race BMX essentially as, as a pro, even though there's not really a pro division back then, because you're you're winning money quite often doing this. I I turned pro at age 15 because at that time, like I said, it was a new sport. I, uh, I started off racing in the beginners class and right away moved from, you know, beginners to, uh, intermediate or novice and intermediate and then to expert. But then at 15, they had a pro class. And then at the local races, they were starting to get, you know, like pro money, just collecting money from passing a hat around and getting from the, from the fans and the families and stuff like that. And yeah, before we knew we had a probably about a hundred to $200 winners, you know, a purse for a winner. So, and then they broke it down to like top three and stuff. So yeah, it was fun to race local racing and making money and making, you know, maybe a hundred to $200 out of a small race. And, uh, um, so yeah, I was the youngest at that time, 15 to turn pro because when I, um, at 15, that's when they had the first pro class in BMX. And so from 19, I think it was 1975, uh, I started racing, uh, I was the youngest. And then at 1976, um, I got a factory sponsor from Mongoose. Um, and, you know, so Mongoose uh, was my first, uh, you know, real contract. And that was in 1976. So, um, yeah, it was really exciting at that time. Yeah, and you kind of rode the wave of BMX as it grew right through right. your early twenties as well. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, everything, any, anything that was changing, I was there and every year there was something new and I would always get the new stuff and all the trick stuff. And then, yeah, as it grew, I grew with it and the sport kept on growing and I was able to travel all over the U S and, uh, uh, the far as I went to in the BMX race was Japan uh, and they, oh. I was there mainly for doing exhibitions, uh, you know, cause it was a new sport. So we went to these places and we, uh, and we were showing the, the, you know, the riders there, uh, you know, how to, you know, race around the course and stuff like that. So we were out there and, you know, just showing, you know, our skills and doing riding on their courses and, and just teaching the, you know, the kids back then about BMX. And so, you know, our team and- mongoose were our, our Mongoose team flew us out there and they, uh, and, you know, so we were able to travel and, and, you know, and do these, uh, invitations, you know, and stuff like that. And so what happens around age 25? Because your results in BMX abruptly stop 
and fairly quickly I can start to find your name again in mountain bike results. Was it just discovering the mountain bike or what was, what, what happened? Yeah. Uh, kind of what happened is after Mongoose, I rode for Mongoose for six years and that was starting around 76. And then I went from 76 to, I think it was around 81 or 82. Mongoose just wanted to get new faces and change the team. And I started, uh, and then I ended up having to go and find smaller teams. And so I got picked up for a couple years after, after Mongoose, and I was riding for smaller companies like Bandito, JMC. Or that's a, two teams that I could remember. Um, and there was a, yeah. And, and then from there, it was just smaller races I was doing. And then um, a, uh, a company uh, introduced me to this bike, and I think it was General Bicycles. And they, uh, you know, they said, hey, check out this bike. And it was a mountain bike. And I go, wow, gears on the bike, you know. And BMX, we only had one gear. And we always had to go to certain races to change our front ring or our back gears. And we were always messing around with gears for the certain straightaways at, at BMX races, you know. So we wanted to have a fast gear. Sometimes the straightaways were really long. So we needed a little bit harder gear to be able to spin it all the way to those corners. And so mountain bike and it had all the gears on the bike and i thought this is great you know now i could ride and shift gears and and i was you know i was good you know mountain biking just started too like bmx it was a brand new sport and there was you know we we started with uh flat pedals and i don't even think we even had toe straps at that moment um you know heavy bikes chromoly and just you know just handbrakes and um and started racing uh, s- uh, some local stuff. And I just got out of BMX just right away. I just like, you know, I was, you know, getting old in that sport. And, you know, and so BMX was the doors just opened up and I just took it. And I started off with like a company called General Bicycles. And they were just the bikes were made in Taiwan. But it was a shop that was carrying these bikes. And they, you know, they started sponsoring me and I was getting a small salary kind of like a weekly salary and that was kind of strange. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, so from there I just started, you know, racing uh, mountain bikes, you know, and you know, whatever races came up. And so they were, uh, they were all cross countries. There was really no long distance stuff. Um, and so it was a good, you know, it was a good change for me because my skills were there. I had all the bike handling that you could, you know, you needed for the sport, but I didn't have that endurance. And then, as you know, just right away, the sport started growing to bringing you know, other riders and the riders were mainly coming from the road and, but they didn't have any skills. So, um, so I just realized when I was in the sport that I needed to get the endurance in me and I just started, um, you know, like getting road bikes, but didn't know anything about road bikes. I, I was really, you know, I mean, I got a bigger bike than I need, uh, too big of a frame. I didn't know the sizes or any of that. So I was, it was a learning, you know, learning lesson, but, um, but I learned quick and like mountain biking, we got to grow while seeing like shocks and then seeing to uh, clip ins and then aluminum frames. And then from aluminum frames, you know, uh, carbons came in late. It did come in late, yeah. but, um, but yeah, I mean, I did everything that was new for to on a bike that was mountain biking. Pretty much. I got the, the trick stuff. Yeah. So let Let's let's talk about the the technology developments and you're kind of riding the wave as it goes. As things like front suspension come in, as things like toe clips come in and all of a sudden you're not getting bounced off the bike. Right. What was that like f- for you? Were you just like what is this magic or yeah. were you like, "Yeah, hey, let's let's go." You know, yeah. What was that like for people that were experiencing it? Well, for me, it was like, I was still young and it felt really cool. You know I mean? Getting free stuff and then able to test stuff out and go, wow, this, you know, just seeing how it all worked out. I mean, you couldn't learn it all in one year. So every time you got something, it was like, you know, you're just, just barely learning something. And the next thing you know, something else cool came out. And so there was always something new. So it just kept the, the riding exciting and, you know, as you're, as you're racing and getting all these cool stuff, you know, you're, you know, it's like next thing you know, another year comes by and then you're getting more new stuff. So it was just really, you know, then you're starting to experience and see what worked best for you and stuff like that. So, um, 
So, yeah, it was, you know, it was really nice. I mean, I had, I was just excited trying new things just to get better, you know, and that was my idea, you know, oh, this, this should work really good. And, and then I kind of knew what was good and what wasn't good. So, um, so yeah. yeah, so it was, everything was just a learning thing, you know, and, you know, and it just helped you ride better and make you go faster. And, and as you're competing against guys that you knew were fast, you just wanted to see what was, you know, what would work for you. So, um, I mean, it was, it was really fun. I mean, it, it, everything was brand new. So, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't complain, you know? Yeah. How often were you able to find races back then? And how did you find races back then? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, it was mainly just through uh, magazines, uh, local, uh, maybe like, um, I, I don't know, there was, you go to bike shops and they would have like weekly papers and stuff like that. And you would go to the back and there was like a list, oh, local races or you know, California and there's Southern California. And then you look for these races like that. Um, you know, I was just kind of, you know, I was new at it. So I just kind of, that was a way, or you just go by word from people, you know, did you hear about this race and things like that? So, um, so yeah, everything was just, you know, like BMX, you know, I learned how to go to local races and find them. And, it, and then it was sort of like you go into mountain bike and it started kind of being the same way. You know, you just go, okay, I could go there or I could, you know, that's too far or that, you know, things like that. And so, yeah, it was just, you know, you learn by, uh, you know, I was, you know, from my sponsor, they also knew what races for me to go to too. So, um, sure. you know, they helped me out and they said, yeah, we'd like you to go to this. And I, yeah, of course I would love to go, you know, so I really had no reason to turn down races because it was, you know, something new to me and it was, you know, it was always more experience, you know? So, um, yeah. Let's talk pre 1996 Olympics. Cause that's the first oh. time mountain biking is in the Olympics. Let's talk before then. Cause you really start mountain biking in the mid eighties. And so that's yeah, a big well, chunk like, of time. I actually started in 86 mountain biking. And okay. then I just went from straight out of Mount BMX or straight into, uh, to mountain biking. And I, you know, I, it was a good change because I had a sponsor right into the new sport of mountain biking. Yeah. And it was yeah. like, a, you know, yeah. How, how much, how much were you traveling pre Olympics? Were you traveling right. mainly still in the United States or were you starting to get into these stage races already? Or did those things not exist at that time? Um, I did. I, I, I was racing with like, with, uh, as I got close to the Olympic, I was racing for like Klein bicycles and I was doing a lot of traveling, you know, mainly I wasn't really traveling overseas. I was just traveling in the U S so I would travel back East and stuff like that. And I was doing all, you know, uh, there was all these Norba nationals and things like that. So I started racing the Norba national when that came out in the scene. And then there was, uh, um, they had a series and that race series became, you know, something I was chasing after. Um, so yeah, so, you know, racing Norba was kind of like the, the start of my, uh, racing career because Norba had like up to, uh, maybe eight or nine nationals back then. And all those nationals were all in different States and things. So I was able to travel like that. And so that's, you know, what Klein was able to do. They were paying my expenses to go to these races. And, and, uh, yeah. And I, I mean, I started off with, you know, usually I started off with a good team and Klein was a good team to, uh, it was a great bike. It was, you know, really an awesome bike. It was light. It was already, you know, the technology that they had was, was amazing because it was looked like a heavy bike because it had these big tubings, but then it was just really light. And, you know, when you're bonds, you know, going down trails and stuff, you're able just to let the bike absorb the dirt. It wasn't, you know, you weren't bouncing around because it was so light. And you, you just learn how to use your hands to just be more, you know, more not so tight, not so tense. And just let the bike do all the, you know, bouncing and stuff like that. And so, so it was really amazing. The bike didn't really lose control when you're really bonds on, you know, going down all these rough trails. And this was out to suspension and stuff. So, I mean, um, so, yeah, it was really exciting, you know, um, at, at that time. And um Right around 94 is when I got a phone call, and that phone call was uh, from Tom Schuller, and that was when they uh, put together this Volvo Cannondale team. And and 
that was right when I had the choice of staying with Klein or them, but the offer was just mind blowing. They were just like, you know, it was over a hundred thousand or something like that. Uh, I tell you, I think the very beginning of my career, I never, you know, in my wildest dream was ever thinking I was going to make that kind of money. So it was sort of like, all right, I'll definitely join the team. So it was a really, it was a, you know, it was an offer you could not, never refuse, you know, as a racer. You, you signed this big deal with Cannondale. Yep. Right on the eve of the Olympics, essentially, a year or two out from then. The 96 Olympics is the first time we have mountain biking in, in Olympic right. Games. Right. I don't really, I'm not really interested in like how you did there, or hearing about that. I want to know how you felt and how excited you were to be like, we're going to do this sport in the Olympics and I'm one of the people. Yeah. Oh man. It was really exciting for sure. Um, uh, you know, for me, it was like a dream come true. I've never ever thought a bike would be, you know, me racing Olympic. That was like something that I, I never even thought would happen. And, and to be, to be the first American to be, you know, to be, to qualify for the Olympics was actually a really big deal too. And that was exciting because there was only two Americans that went. And so I was at that time at my, you know, I was really at my, you know, at going at my peak, you know, I was at my best racing in career. I mean, I won like the Norba title. So that was an automatic, almost making it to the U S team. And plus all the UCI race I was doing, I was top American in points and, you know, my results were, you know, probably better than all the Americans to make the team. So, uh, so yeah, it was a really, it was a lot of, it was quite nervous because uh, they were putting a lot of, like, I haven't even got to Olympics and I was like getting into magazines and all this stuff. And I was like, you know, I haven't even put a result up, but they were like making me act like I was going to win the Olympics. And I go, so that was quite a bit of pressure as this right there. Because I haven't even got to Olympics and I'm like making magazines, best American going to the Olympics and all that. So that was right there. I think it kind of was putting uh, a huge amount of pressure on me uh, because, you know, now, you know, now they think I'm going to win the Olympics, you know, before I even got to the Olympics. So um, but it, it was, you know, I mean, it was really, really uh, awesome feeling. You know, that's all I could really say. Um you know, uh, how, did, just, how did you deal with how did you deal with all that pressure of of seeing yourself in these magazines and this expectation that you were feeling towards you and what you were supposed to do? Did you just internalize that or have people to talk to about it? Or how did you work through that? Um, I don't think I really handled it so well. Um, honestly, it was a lot of pressure and I didn't really have, you know, anybody to put my, you know, answer, you know, how can I handle this better and things like that. So I just had to just, just do it, you know, like going to another race, but, you know, instead of another race, the biggest, you know, biggest event in the yeah. world. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really hard. I mean, I honestly didn't know how to really handle it. So I just kind of just, you know, it just really was this nervous, you know, a lot of pressure was, uh, I could definitely feel it. Um, you know, and, but I wasn't getting pressure from my team or anything like that. They weren't like, you know, expecting a lot out of me or anything, but it was just really, uh, to think that I'm going to Olympics and, you know, now, you know, you know, it was just, it was a lot of pressure. So I don't think I really handled it so well. I wish I would have had someone to really guide me into it a little bit, make me more relaxed about it and, you know, get coached, even, you know, be able to handle it better. But they just thought I had it under control and it was really something I didn't you know, really speak up or anything about it. I just, you know, well, you know, here we go. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Did you do anything different going into 2000? Um, and maybe you didn't feel like the expectations were quite the same because it was in Australia versus the United States, but yeah, right. how did you approach that Olympic games differently? Um, yeah, it was definitely a lot different because, first of all, there was everybody that seen the first Olympic uh, mountain bikers were really focused on the next one. They, you know, they seen how how great that was. And now, you know, they see this big opportunity to make the Olympics. So um, so it was definitely a lot harder, first of all, just to qualify for the Olympics because there was more riders that were all hungry to want to make that, you know, make that team the U S team. And, um, so yeah, it was, you know, just that itself was a challenge just to try to make it. So 
I had a good, you know, some good competitors that were really, you know, it was really, uh, it was kind of like a decision, you know, are we going to take Tinker or are we going to take this guy or whatever? Because it was so close in points. It was actually, I think it was, I forget his name at the moment, um, uh, Steve Larson. Steve Larson mm-hmm. at that time was my big threat. And we were literally, uh, but it was, it was either we both were going to make it, but we didn't know for sure who, you know, if they were going to take one American or two Americans. So it was a battle. I mean, we were looking at the points at every race. I mean, it was coming that close to where we went to UCI, even if we didn't win, you know, like if we placed 10th and he placed 14th or, you know, those points, you know, were, you know, 10th is better than 14th. So, so we, I mean, we were like even looking at our results, you know, no matter if we won, you know, how, you know, what place did we finish? And it was that close. I mean, and it, but, you know, I, I got called to be able to make it. And I think it was uh, Steve Larfin. Uh, he didn't make it for some reason. It was so close. But, um, you know, I made it, you know, instead of him. And I think it was either Don Myra or, uh, no, I think Don Myra was at the first Olympic. I think it was Travis. Travis Brown at uh, road for uh, track at the time. I think it was me and Travis that might've made it. Um, so, yeah. And uh, I don't know what, you know, it was, I just knew that Steve Larson, whatever happened, he came and fire after the Olympics and his, his training plans kind of was, it kind of happened too late. He didn't his prepare for it. It all kind of came up too late. He just, you know, his training like came after it seemed like he trained it either too soon or too late or something where he just missed it so he was after the olympics you know he was on fire the rest of the season it was like and it was a bummer that he didn't you know wasn't able to make that training earlier so he could have been on you know better focus for the olympics but um you know that is the way it goes you know (laughs) yeah so after after the Olympics in 2000, your results kind of there's a big shift from going uh, cross country to more of the ultra endurance to the marathon side of things. Yeah, and we start seeing your first 24 hour results popping up uh, in 2001. What caused that shift to move away from cross country and start doing more of the marathon and even the 24 hour stuff? Um. Well, what I kind of what I've seen is that now more riders are getting faster. And so after the second Olympics, you know, this riders just, you know, are just starting to get better. There was more riders getting, you know, getting into the sport and, uh, and my results were not as good. So I had to really, I, I, I had to see what I had, you know, to do to get better and got lucky that there was these other new sports that started coming into it. And it was 24 hour racing and I started, you know, seeing, you know, seeing it pop up in the magazine. I go, wow, you know, these races are getting enough attention to make the magazine. Man, I, I better start seeing if, you know, cause I always loved training. And I always liked training long. So now my longer trainings were not really working so good for the cross country. And, uh, I wasn't as, you know, I was losing that speed or whatever it was. And, uh, I wasn't winning the races the way I used to win. So the endurance just, you know, the 24 hours just came in just in time. And my sponsor just were happy to say, yeah, go for it. And they were just liking what my, you know, what I was, you know, focusing on now. And they were, you know, so that gave me motivation to, uh, you know, now to, you know, focus on long distance racing. And it was the 24 hours uh, were just, they were already, they already started. But, you know, and I started reading these different riders. And so I thought, okay, now is the time to join, you know, start racing 24 hours. And so I did, and it, it was a, you know, it was a good time to do it. Um, it was a lot of races to choose from, and I was able to get, you know, enough races for this for the year to do. And so yeah, so I, I started just doing that, and my sponsors were able to, uh, you know, they were psyched about it. So I was able to continue with the contract, you know, because of that. How big of a mind shift was it going from the cross country where it's just like wide open to the 24 hour racing where it's still pretty wide open, but you're doing it for such a long time? What what was the mentality like uh, and, and shifting into that different mentality? Um, 
It was, I don't know, for me, because I was so good. I, I loved training long and I loved riding, you know, training hard. So the the 24 hours just worked out just, you know, better for me because it was what I like to do. I like to ride my bike. And so riding my bike all day, let's do it. And uh, so my mind was set to ride my bike and I knew I had the endurance in me and I, and I used to train all the time, you know, hard. So now I could be able to now put my, you know, my race, you know, my, my training into the 24 hours. So, um, so the mindset for me was good because I haven't done, I was just learning how to get into endurance and, and learn how to train along. And so my legs haven't had that, you know, that enough, you know, enough burnout time. So it was all like exciting. So I was able to be able to train long distance and you know recover after them and then continue to do another race and so i was up to like four or five races a year doing 24 hours and that was a lot at that time and uh and my recovery was not bad either i mean i was um i was you know needed time off the bike you know but i wasn't really off the bike i just i was um just you know uh, mainly just riding but not riding hard and so, yeah, it's just to rest up. So I didn't have to train a lot to be ready for my next one because I already had enough miles in my legs to continue to focus for the other races to come. Um, so, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So you win, you win four national 24 hour championships. Uh, but probably the most notable thing I, you know, aside from the Mata Hay that I want to talk to you about is you win the world championships at 24 hours in 2007 in Monterey. Right. And you you know that I'm good friends with Kelly McGelkey and I've heard his side of what that day is like or not necessarily his side, but his take on what that day was like. And uh, I've read a lot of stories about it. it was 100 degrees at the start. You're doing 13 mile laps and there's 2,500 feet of climbing and Kelly leads the whole way until the last lap. And then right. you're able it's to attack to really hard. Yeah, and, yeah, it was really uh, and, surprisingly. Um, yeah, sorry for cutting in, but um, no, you're good. I just I want to hear about the whole day. I want to hear. Well, I want to hear about the I race. I can't really tell you about. I mean, I don't know. I wish I could remember all my races, but I I am definitely every time I get done with any race, I think about the next race and forget about the race behind <laughs> me. But um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, but um, as far as uh, uh, as far as me and Kelly, um, I knew that my good friend uh, Ed, as you know, he used to come with me uh, to a lot of my races. He was always helping me out, and he just couldn't believe that last lap. I mean, first of all, when we were at the night, it was even hard to know if he was going or not going, and you know, and to stay up with Kelly during the night, you know, I, I would kind of like, did he go yet? Did he go yet? And I was like asking my team because it was dark and we didn't know exactly when he took off and stuff. So I was always like nervous about him getting away. And so that was kind of a, 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 a challenge in itself during the night, just to stay with him because I, you know, we would come into the pit. I wouldn't know if he was going to stay in for a minute or go out right away or sneak away or do something. But, um, but, we, you know, somehow we hung together and and he, you know, really wanted to, uh, you know, to lead the whole race. And for me, I just think, well, if he could lead the whole race and I'm going to if I could follow him, then I'm going to follow him. So he, you know, it's kind of his style. You know, his style is always, you know, if he wants he likes to be out in front, bottom line, you know, yep. and yep. if he likes to be out in front, I like to be behind him. And, and so, yeah, I, I have to just, you know, so I stayed behind him, but I just, whatever happened on that final lap, I just knew that it, I was on fire. I just, you know, got this energy from nowhere and I, I just took off on that last lap. And when you look back and you don't, and don't see your rider starting to like hang, hang with you, that just gives you more energy. You don't have no energy, but you can find it. It's that adrenaline that just kicks in, and I just took off and never looked back. And it looked like I was like taking off on my first lap on that on that final 23 hours or 22 hours, whatever it was. So um, yeah, and you know, and it it came from all the you know all those racing that you have done before that, preparing for the 24 hour world. Everything just you know kind of all hits you at one time at that at that 
that moment to want to win that world. And it all just, you know, kind of sunk in at that moment and everything just went perfect. So, you know, so yeah, I was, uh, it was definitely one that I really wanted and it was nice to be able to win. And, you know, so. And you've won two other world titles as well as a master's uh, division, correct? One of them was at Mount St. Anne and I, where's the other one at? Yeah, I won, I won three. So I won my first 24 or my first master uh, world championship was in Brazil. And that was when I first did my master's world championship. So I thought, well, this would be good to try to win a rainbow Jersey that I never won and, and cross country. Now I can maybe do it at least in masters. And for as long as I, you know, have never raced masters, it's, it was amazing how big master is and how tough the competition is. And so I went into this sport with, you know, with this sport been there for a long time. So for me to get into it, uh, there was a lot of good competition at that time, you know, at that age. So it's really good to see that they have this master world championship. So when I did it, I won it in Brazil and it was my first world. Yeah. My first cross country masters world. Then I won it in, um, you know, Mount St. Anne. And what was nice about that one in Mount St. Anne, I forget the year, but my first world champion or my first uh, World Cup win was in Mount St. Anne. Um, my very first ever winning a World Cup in my elite class was in Mount St. Anne. And then who knows how long later it was. I'm back to Mount St. Anne. Of course, I don't think I, I know the, the venue and stuff, but I don't remember what course I raced in the cross country when I did win that year. But it's just being in the same, you know, the same, you know, resort and everything. And then I ended up, you know, I got, I had luck, got lucky because the guy that was ahead of me, he got a puncture, but he was able to get a wheel change because he had a pit with wheels there, you know, waiting for him. But once I knew he was slowing down and I looked at the rear back of his tire, I just like, oh, he got a flat. Now I just went full gas and it was towards the end of the race and it was a drag, but I still won his racing and, and then to win. The world's again, and you know, world championship in Mount Saint Anne. That was really a kind of a, you know, it was really special because to win my first ever cross country and to win my Masters world champion here was really something to always never forget. You know, I'll never forget that because of you know being in Mount Saint Anne in Canada, and so um, sure, yeah. And then my third one was in France, and that was another cross country was always hard because in the Masters we it's so short that the guys are always right there because you cannot, it's hard to get a gap on a track that's less than four miles, you know, and yeah. it's, you know, it's such a, you know, it's, it's just, you're on the gas and there are guys that are so close, but um, it was a close battle to win the one in France and it was a long journey to get there. And it was, it's a crazy journey, but um, it's another story. But we've, you know, we finally got all the way to the Alps and we went from Brazil, uh, from, uh, not Brazil, from Spain, Barcelona, all the way to the Alps driving. It was a long, long drive to get there. And, and, but, you know, we won that race. It was a special moment to win something that took us forever to get there. But we made it and we got to the, cross the finish line. And my good friend, uh, Manolo, uh, that drove all the way and set it up. You know, this guy is like my, like my uh, brother in Spain. And, uh, and he really, you know, without his help, I would have never had a chance to even win that, that, that race in, um, uh, France, but, um, yeah, so three worlds and, um, actually I'm yeah. going to be trying to, yeah, trying to go for it again this year. I I'm set to go to Australia to race the world. And, um, awesome. yeah, I bought my, yeah, I got my ticket and I'm, I just signed up not too long ago. So it's in May, so it's coming up. So I'm okay. really psyched. Yeah. I'm really psyched. Yeah, that'll be amazing. Yeah. So um, amidst all this super <laughs> long distance, 24-hour stuff, right. and you're chasing the Masters world titles, you find yourself in Western North Dakota at the Mata Hay 100. Right. And I, I am wanting to know how you ended up out there. And then I think once you were there, you just you kept coming back because Nick is a great host. It's a great race. It's a beautiful right. place. But I want to know how you got there to begin with. Well, 
I honestly think I heard this from Kelly somewhere before I, you know, we, before I seen him at North Dakota. I think somehow I raised him or something that he told me, oh, you should, if you ever get a chance, do Monahe. And he was the one that was winning the races from the beginning. And I was like, I was always in a hunt of trying to get promoters to fly me to their race. And I got lucky to, uh, to contact the promoter in Monahe. And, uh, and you know, it was Nick and then Nick was nice and said, you know, we would love to have you, you know, let me know whatever it takes. We'll get you here. And, and that's kind of how it started. So I had a race to put in my calendar for the year and that was, you know, Matahe for that month. And, uh, and then Nick was so nice, you know, to invite me that, you know, he took care of me the whole time I was there. So it was really a treat. And so I got to, you know, stay at a hotel. Then, and then I heard all, all the stories, you know, with Nick's side and, you know, his, you know, his girlfriend's uh, father owns the hotel and on and on. So I, I got to learn a lot about Nick's whole family. And it was really, a really nice story, you know, because there was, you know, he's had so many, uh, there was just so many people involved in, you know, in Nick's life that, you know, you know, once he, uh, yeah, so it kind of just, you know, once I got to really like Nick and Nick liked me and he loved having me in his race and his race was really a cool race. This, you know, the, the work that he put to put the race on, it was just a nice story in itself. And, uh, and then the people were super nice and, and I never thought of North, Co North Dakota being so much fun, but I've never, never ridden a course that was, 100 miles almost of all single track i mean you know and literally you, you can minus maybe five miles of just open road at the whole entire race but i have never done a race that's literally point to point 100 miles of all single track and and, and you know if mountain biking is all about riding single track so everybody wants to buy a mountain bike that are just re recreation people going out on weekends they want to ride single track. They don't want to ride fire roads. They don't want to ride anything that's boring. They want to go downhill or ride fun single track. And this this had it all. I mean, this was one long roller coaster from point to point. It was a ride that I, you get a ticket and you get that ticket to ride this 100 miles and you have the most fun of your whole life for, you know, nine hours of riding single track. So, um, and after every time I say that, I always say once I, you know, after this race, I don't need to practice single track for the whole year. I'll just ride <laughs> road, you know? So yeah, it was really, a, really a dream. And, and what's fun about it is that it's a fun single track. It's, it's like a, hey Josh, it's like, love your haircut. <laughs> My son just walked in. He was say, say hello. It, hello, John, right? So John. <laughs> right, yeah. John? Hey man. Yeah, this is so, my son, yeah. Joshua. He just got a haircut. Right on, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, he just walked. <laughs> this is a podcast, correct? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what's up, podcast? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, he's a big you're, kid. You were at the uh, race this past year, right, man? Was yeah, he did come. Yeah, I did. Wait, which one? Uh, the Monahe. Monahe. Yeah, I was there. I was there. I yeah, was there. and uh, he got oh, to man. see me suffer. He never seen me. Mm -hmm. I told him I haven't suffered that hard in a long time. And I literally suffered and he was there that gave me the motivation to finish. Oh, yeah. So that gave me even extra suffering. So I, I really stuck it out, but it was, you know, without him there, I don't know if I would have had the, the drive to have made it, but I knew that if I didn't make it, I would have never seen his face at the finish line until mm -hmm. somewhere getting picked up on the ground, laying somewhere dead. But uh, yeah, he gave me the spark to get done, and I was happy that he went and he seen me. You know, there's good times and bad times, and he just seen me at a bad time. And he, now he knows that what it takes to sacrifice when you're really, you know, hurting. So he got to see me sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, that was dope. It was just good to see you push that hard. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> That's yeah. So anyway, sorry about that, but um, had to. No, you're good, good, man. Of course, yeah. of course. Yep. Yeah. So you you go to the race. I believe the first time you go there is in 2017, and it was shortened that year because of the rain. Oh uh, right, right. Yeah. And then uh, in 18, 18, you came back. You beat Kelly, and you get the course record. 
2019, like I said, you and I line up actually next to each other on the start line. You go in again. The heat ate me alive that year. Uh, yeah. 2020, you and Josh Testato battle. Uh, 2021, you and Kelly battle again, and he gets the course record, uh, and you help him get the win that day. Why Why do you keep coming back? Because some people might see your results and think, oh, it's going really well for you. It's still a hard race. It's still it's a hard still race. It's still a really yeah. – it's <laughs> such a hard race. So what keeps bringing you back, man? Well, I – you know, it's mainly – you know, I, I love North Dakota and I love – Nick is a great friend. He became super nice to me, you know, and he treats me well. And really, when you when you get invited now to any race, you know, um, it's rare. It's not it doesn't happen all the time. So I'm really just thankful to have, you know, Nick invite me to his races, first of all. And then it's not an easy race. So, it, you know, so I'm not going to just go and pick a cherry pick a race. It's going to be a hard earning race to try to win. And, you know, you, you have to come in being fully confident and being riding really well to do this race. And so, yeah, so it's not, you know, and it, it's definitely going to continue to help me uh, stay strong for the rest of the season. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go, oh, why did I do this race? Because now I feel slower. No, it's going to keep my fitness up to be, I have to be fit to be going there, first of all. And then after I finish that, if I do recover well and finish the season, I'll, I'll have good fitness for the rest of the season. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a really, it's a really good choice for me to do in my calendar of racing. And, um, and, you know, so, um, so yeah. And then there's, why, you know, why is this, why is the race so hard? Um, I think cause of the concentration that you have to put the whole entire race. There's a lot of races where you're on Jeep rows and stuff. And, you know, you don't have to focus on, you know, the straightaways, you know, it's, it's hard. But in Monahay, you got to focus on just staying on this tiny trail for, you know, eight or nine hours. So your mind is always concentrating on a single, you know, the single track trail. And you can't, you don't really have time to just take your mind off, maybe going uphill, but you're still got to stay on a, t- a tiny trail. And so you're always got to focus on staying on this trail the whole entire race. And I think that right there, and then you have these gates that you have to lift up and these gates become heavier than heavier as you go on. And uh, so I think that is, I think it's mainly just having that, that mental focus for a whole entire race, you know, where in a lot of races, you don't have to put that much energy on it, on a, you know, on a track. I mean, it's a different kind of focus on some races, you know, some races, it's just a Jeep road and maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's just different, you know, because of that. It's mainly because of the, the focus. You have to stay on the trail. You got to ride all the trails at a certain speed. You can't break too, you know, too much. You got to flow with the trails all the time. And that means that you got to always stay on the gas. And as soon as you make bobbles and turns and stuff, then, then that takes energy away. And then you start to get frustrated because you're making too many mistakes. So, um, so yeah, it's really just trying to have a good, a good rhythm, entire race. And that makes it, it, you know, makes it hard. I think, you know, what, what is a person like, if you were going to talk to somebody who's never done the race before and there, they ask you, what do I have to do to be successful at that race? What would, what would your advice be to them? Um, Mainly just to be, uh, just to be focused on, uh, uh, on a single track, you know, like I was saying, it's all about single track racing. And, you know, if you're, if, you know, if, if they're not good at single track, they're going to be in trouble because they're going to be using their brakes too hard and, and they're not going to be able to shift correctly. They're going to overshift or, you know, like you don't have to shift a lot on this track because you should be running on your top gears, your harder gears. And, and then, you know, when you start to climbing, you know, you're going to be shifting quicker and, uh, you know, quickly because they're just the, the hills just come straight up. They're not like flat climbing, you know, so you're you got to be prepared for that. You know, like that different quick change from fast to going straight up. And then you have to have that good recovery going right back to, you know, back back into the single track and again and again. So. Um, so, yeah, it's just mainly just be focused for a long day of all single track and. Uh, and, you know, try to be light on your brakes as possible, you know. 
but uh, you know, I always tell them that it's a good race because you know it's uh, everything is done. I mean, the track is easy to figure out. It's you know following these these wooden uh, posts all the way, and you'll see them for miles and miles. And uh, but you know we for some reason we still could get you know we me and Kelly have made mistakes, and we we surprise we catch ourselves right away because we've done it for so long. But most guys, if they don't really, if they miss a turn and stuff, you could literally go for a while and keep on going on a, a trail that looks like it's the you know, same track because they all look the same once you ride them for a while. So, um, yeah. So the, one of the questions that I, as I was producing the Mata Hay documentary this year, and, and people then think I like have all the answers about the trail, one th- question I get all the time is, why does Tinker ride a hardtail out here? And I tell him, I'm like, I, I, I know he has a full suspension because I see it on Instagram, but I don't see you race it very often. You're mostly on a hardtail. Why do you like that bike so much? I'm old school mainly, and I've always started with a hardtail, and I've always raced a hardtail. And I mean, I'll race some of the gnarliest tracks that are, you know around in the world almost, and you'll see me on a hardtail. Then um, I've I've just mainly because it's just a lighter bike. Probably the number one, for my number one reason is just lighter. It means to me it's faster. Yeah, now I'm going to get the punishment out there on the, a lot of technical stuff. But, you know, I'm, I, I know how to handle the technical stuff. I have to actually I have to focus a little bit more than most of the guys at full suspension. I have to really focus on the smoothest line on a technical course where a lot of guys at full suspension don't have to focus that hard on the technical stuff. So that right there makes it more challenging because, you know, I'm not on a full suspension. I got to always know that. And I always know anything that's hard. Just because they're able to ride it doesn't mean you're going to be able to ride it as smooth as they are. And so, you know, I've just learned how to be able to take the punishment from a full, you know, on rough course. Um, But, you know, now that the full suspensions are pretty similar, like they're close in weight, I I would say probably maybe a pound or two pounds difference. It's still a lot, but, you know, on some races, it definitely would would make sense to be on a full suspension. But a lot of races that I pick are pretty are are pretty good for hardtails. You know, they're not saying um, they're better, but you know, I could handle them. So I don't know. I'm I'm just you know I'm still you know I my back doesn't bother me. I'm not you know not walking where I I can't handle it anymore. Every time I hear somebody talk about a suspension, go man, I'm tired of riding a hardtail because my back is messed up or this something to do with their back or their body. And I really haven't seen those. I haven't had those complaints to be able to go, you know what? I cannot ride a hardtail anymore. So, um, but yeah, so, but, you know, I'm going to start because now I'm on a, you know, a master's division class. I could, you know, I could ride a full suspension and still probably win the races, you know, no different. And, uh, but um, yeah, so I'm not in the elite class where I don't, you know, you know, weight used to have been an issue. Um, but now I think I could win on any bike. Uh, but I'm still, you know, um, I'm hoping that Zero Uno is supposed to be coming out with a signature bike. This is my dream. This is what we've talked about over the winter. So I'm honestly waiting for it. I don't, you know, I haven't found out what's taking it, the why it's taking long. But all I know is that, they have, I'm going to have a signature hardtail bike and, you know, and that's, you know, uh, not the reason why I'm still riding a hardtail is that, you know, they've, you know, they're making a signature bike on a hardtail. So, you know, I'm excited about that to promote this bike once I get it. Yeah. You, you have a really good relationship with Zero Uno, it seems. It's allowed you to keep racing. Um, well, one, yeah, um, one, kind of, you know, it's a new relationship, honestly, because last year right, I was riding correct. With, yeah, I was riding with Floyd of, you know, Floyd of Leadville for two years and they were able to get just a bike sponsor for me last year. So the only thing that uh, Zero Luna got me was just a frame, uh, you know, frame okay. and four. So but I was still, you know, I wasn't anything else with Zero Luna. They just gave me a bike and that was it. 
And but they didn't gotcha. give the other guys, the other team riders on on Floyd because none of them were really a mountain biker, and they all wanted you know. And I think Zero Owners just said, you know what, we could give Tinker a bike, but sorry, we 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 can't give the whole team bikes. So um, so I was excited that they gave me the only guy on the team to get a bike from Zero Uno. But um, I, I, I told them, you know, that there's a good chance I won't be riding with Floyd because there's been a lot of problems. And so with that, they, you know, we made an agreement that, that, you know, yeah, we'll fully sponsor you this year if, you know, if you don't ride with Floyd. So that's how it all started, you know. So now I'm just waiting for bikes. <laughs> You might say, I don't want to talk about this. I totally respect that. <laughs> I think a lot of times people say, or people have said to me, why do you have pros on? I don't have a lot in common with pros. And I, and I always look for ways that we are in common, um, whether we're professionals or not. Right. I think one of the most real things that you have gone through and explained was you had a really long relationship with Cannondale that ended abruptly and surprisingly. Right. And, and I think it was some of your more real, like human responses that we've seen, you know, you were not like this, uh, robotic racer that we all admire. You were this like very real person about like, I had this relationship and it ended in a way that I wasn't happy with. You had, you said earlier that you had a sponsorship end and it kind of pushed you towards thinking about mountain biking when you were in BMX this relationship ends. It was really hard on you uh, from the outside, it appeared. And yet you're still here racing. Right. And so how did you work through that? And how did you decide to to keep doing this thing? Because I um, think that's most relatable to everybody listening. Yeah. Well, it was a shock to me big time. You know, it was shocking that they just kind of let me go the way they did. It was just a phone call. Hey, you know, and it was almost like, you know, we don't need you no more. And it's like, you know, well, you know, go ahead. And, you know, it was so, sort of like that. We don't need you no more. Uh, we, we done everything we could possibly do with you. And that was it. I just like was shocked to hear those words. And, but it doesn't, you know, the company changed in a, you know, a, a 360. They completely let all the best people from Canada in the beginning when I was with Volvo Canada. So probably half of those years, half that 27 years was the best years with Canada. And the second half with new people running the business and new corporation and all is about money and this stuff, you know. I really, I didn't even know if I had a, you know, a team with Canada every year because I had nobody to talk to that was really wanting to like, like be on my side on their, on the company. I really didn't have like, yeah, I might have had someone that, you know, that I talked to monthly, but he wasn't, you know, like, it wasn't like a friendly kind of conversation where I did like with Canada. There was like a family back in the days. And now it's like, you know, I, I don't even know who I talk to to find out if I have a contract next year. So when I seen everybody getting let off, I'm thinking, why them? Why not me? You know, why am I still on the team? And why did they let all these great people go? And then surprisingly, you know, it caught up and then it was me. And yeah, so to end the story, I just, you know, I done every, my best, uh, best life in racing was with Canada. So I will never forget that, you know, it was just the way they did it. They could have done it a lot more professionally, you know, hey, Tinker, you know, we're going to let you go at the end of the year. Something like that would have been better than this phone call and just saying, Hey, you know, we're done with you. So, you know, of course, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be angry and I'm going to be like my, you know, my heart just hit the ground. And uh, so, yes, but you know, it was amazing. The people, the support that I got after that happened. And with that, it just started giving me a little bit more motivation. Then when I, the, the probably the nicest thing that I got out of Floyd's team you know, not being mean, but, you know, they, you know, they had a lot of promises they didn't stay with, but the best phone call they ever got was when, when Floyd called me after he heard about me, once I heard that, you know, Canada dumped me, uh, Floyd said, man, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that this happened to you, Tinker, man. I really want to, I, I really wish I could do something. You let me know if there's anything I could do for you. And he, and I go, wow. You know, and he says, you know, we're going to you know, pretty much, he wanted to start his team because he did not have even a mountain bike team. And he started this team because he said, I want to do anything to, you know, anything to help you. He goes, if it's money, I'll take care of you. 
you know, whatever Cannondale was doing, I, I'll do the same. It was sort of like that conversation over the phone was like, this is shocking. I, you know, first of all, I, I know Floyd, but I've never talked to Floyd. And, you know, so Floyd, you know, I raced him in mountain biking back in the early, you know, when he started mountain biking and we had, you know, good battles back then. But uh, for him to give me that phone call was just like a really dream come true. And after that dream came true, at the end of the whole, after two years with uh, with Floyd, I really lost my 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 love for Floyd after what, you know, what happened with the team, because it was sort of like a nightmare because all the promises that was promised on that one phone call never it, it never happened after that. So it was <laughs> but I, I do love him for being you know, give him that phone call because it really meant a lot to me. And he did start a team and the first year was a little rocky, but I still, okay, I'm going to stick it out another year. And then that next year was just, it was horrible. So, so it was, but, um, but yeah, so that drive gave me motivation to stick with it and, you know, having employed to, you know, have a team that year, the first year was okay. But like I said, after that, I didn't, you know, have anything to jump on. So I had no choice but to stick with him. And then, you know, and then after that, you know, my career, I'm like 62. And uh, so I thought, well, you know what? You got a house over your head. You know, it's not the end of the world. You can still race bikes. You know, people still want you to come to the races. You know, you'll find something and something will come together. And, you know, and I just stuck with it. I figure I have nothing to lose, you know. And uh, I've done the sport my whole entire life. I always dreamed of having my least something out of the sport besides just a racer, but maybe Zero Uno might give me this answer and having a signature bike, you know, I'm thinking this is cool, you know, hey, you know, 55, 56, 58 years of racing, you got a signature bike, that's, you know, you know, that's better than nothing, you know, you know, so yeah, so I'm ex at least excited about, you know, able to push a new, uh, a new brand and my my first brand and I could go to races and now I could kind of show this off at the, you know, for people to see and maybe people to buy and want. You, you, you mentioned you are 62 years old. Well, actually I, I'm I know from, I'm 63. Now. <laughs> that was, uh, oh, yeah. you're 63 now. Yeah. Oh, my bad. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, the, but I, I hear so many people when I'm at the Matahe, when I'm at these, uh, Matahe film premieres, right. And and they talk about how inspired they are by you because you're still doing this and you're still going at it at a high level. And as you inspire all these people, my my last question is, what is inspiring you to keep doing this? What what makes you get up in the morning and do this? Yeah. Um like you said, I you know, expiring you know i always get comments from people who are going stay with the tinker you know i have fans on you know on facebook and instagram that they love that i'm still doing it and when you read you know read these over and over every single day it's just like you know why should i stop now because i get people that are just starting bike riding they were like 40 or 50 and they go man i look up to you i said don't give up man i said i i started riding my bike because of you and I'm, you know, I thought it was too late in their career and they thought it was like, Oh, I can't do this anymore. But now they see me, it's like an extra motivation. And so i I have so many fans that really send me the most coolest things. And those little things are, they, they stick with me in my heart. And those are the things that keep me driving, you know, just reading just the things that how they, you know, they tell me about, man, I, I remember seeing you in the magazines when I, you know, I started racing, mountain biking and these guys do not ride anymore but then they see me still doing it and it's just like it's incredible to them so um you know i just you know i just thank the lord first of all for giving me the strength and the confidence and the power to do what i do i honestly believe without him the man upstairs that i wouldn't be here today i thank god every day for just giving me the power and just to be able to do it and, you know, and to be able to say I'm doing it for a living, it's just, you know, what more, you know, that's the motivation that I always I need. It's just, you know, having, you know, whenever God thinks it's done, then it's over. But at the moment, he's like gave me fire to keep on going. And I really don't see any time, any time or any reason why I should motivate. When I see 
when I sign up in the Masters category in the World Championship and I see a guy up there, a 70-year-old, 70-plus racing in, in a cross country, I go, I'm going to be just like that guy. I want to race until I'm 70. So, yeah, we have to set a, a – we have to set uh, what I'm going to say. We have to set a, uh, I don't know, a motivation for the kids that are coming in. You know, I want to set an example, a perfect example that it's never too late. And that's kind of like the coolest thing to say. It's never too late. If I could do it, you could definitely do it. And I want to continue to do it because it'll always give, you know, somebody else motivation to, to do it. What an amazing ending, Tinker. Thank, Thank you. you for, uh, Hang, hanging out with yeah. us today and, well, and just sorry. sharing so I'm, much of your story. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I hope that I, I answered most of it pretty good. I, I'm not good at this, but I I figure, hey, who's going to tell me that I'm not, you know? So, <laughs> so, except myself. So anyways, I did the best I can, you know, and I'm just happy that it, you asked me to do this. It was really an honor. So thank you for asking me to do this you know my son was excited i told him that hey i got a podcast you, you do and he, you know to them he <laughs> knows how big of a deal that is to me it's like oh, i'm just going to do a talk and you know i i'll literally see you know somewhere in my life i'll think about man that was so cool that i did a podcast you know and it is cool i'm really thankful thank you so much yeah no for sure for sure yeah. and all this has been is just a long conversation tinker and you've been awesome at it so all right. tinker juarez everybody thank you so much thanks for listening today if you are looking for more content head on over to the stable cyclist youtube channel where you can find the film Matahe, where you will find tinker sprinkled throughout it as well as kelly mcgelke and tyler huber's amazing story from this past year at the Matahe 100 you can find me on Instagram at The Stable Cyclist. Stable Cyclist Podcast is a twice monthly show that focuses on bikes, mentality, and when it feels right, we'll even dive deep into mental health. Episodes will always drop on the first and third Friday of each and every month, but keep your eyes peeled because we'll also have bonus episodes from time to time. Thanks for listening today and hanging out, and most importantly, above everything, remember you are loved.